started. Can you see my screen now? Okay. Okay, so uh, good morning, everyone. Just give me a moment, actually, just trying to... We are ready. Yeah. So good morning again. Uh, so we have come a long distance uh, in our understanding of uh, <clears throat> the various concepts involved in uh, radio interferometry. And today we are uh, ready to put everything together and to really understand that how it all uh, actually works together. Now, uh, just for a quick recap of the things that we have done. Uh, so we started with uh, EM waves, uh, general properties, and then we tried, and then we understood actually that uh, what the radio window is, and at those wavelengths, then uh, we can, uh, to start with, use a single dish. We could actually would have used also a dapple antenna, but we found that it does not have as much good gain or directional properties. Since that is the case, then we found that a parabolic reflector with a dapple at its focus would be a better configuration to do it. And then we also have uh, now a good idea of Fourier transforms and Fourier optics. And we understand that how uh, uh, for a given aperture, what kind of uh, response or the point spread function it will have, right? So that's uh, everything that we have done. And then we also uh, did some back of the envelope calculation and tried to see like if uh, we have like if approximately 50 meter dish and at 1.4 gigahertz uh, that we have taken this frequency because that's corresponds to uh, H121 centimeter line. It's like uh, if there is something we want to do in radio astronomy, then uh, we would certainly want to do it at this frequency, look at nuclear hydrogen in the universe, right? So, uh, and, and if, it's, if that's the frequency, that's the size of the aperture we have, that gives us a resolution of about 0.3 degrees. And that is not good enough, right? Uh, to achieve our uh, uh, goals, scientific goals. So, uh, then what we want to do is, uh, our motivation is to get better angular resolution and sensitivity and we were at a point yesterday where we uh, sort of uh, getting to understand that the solution would be in radio interferometry where instead of using just a single aperture, we actually use an ensemble of apertures and make measurements using them. And then using uh, those measurements, we can make an image of the intensity distribution in the sky. So that's the idea, right? So now today we, what we are going to do, we are going to understand a little bit more in depth that what is meant by using an ensemble of dishes to make a measurement and what, uh, how does that improve the resolution and how it actually works, right? So radio interferometry. So what we are going to do, our goal here is to understand that how we can do aperture synthesis, which is that using an ensemble of antennas, how can we synthesize an aperture which is much larger than the diameter of a single aperture or the single dish. So now to understand this, uh, we need to again go back and uh, let us uh, go back to Michelson's interferometer. And uh, that's because all interferometry uh, has its uh, roots in this uh, experiment. So this was built at Mount Wilson Observatory. And what it did uh, all approximately 100 years ago was it measured, measured the size of Betelgeuse star, which uh, has been in use quite uh, lately, right? And, uh, and the fringes at that time were observed by eye, right? So that uh, it was quite demanding experiment. So the simple setup of Michelson's interferometer is shown in the slide. So what it consists of, it consists of a fixed uh, mirror. You can see here, this one is a fixed mirror and then another mirror, which is movable. Right. So what happens that the beam which is incoming from here, then it is uh, it hits a beam splitter and then its intensity amplitude is split into two beams. So the, these two beams will be then weaker than the incident beam, of course, because we have split. 
and now each of these beams is reflected back to this thin beam splitter which is there and then after uh, and, and and then these beams are then combined by this adjustable mirror right and then what happens that if the phase difference between these two light beams is zero then on uh, the two these two beams will interfere constructively and a very high intensity signal will be measured on the photo detector which is shown here okay and in contrast if the phase difference is half the wavelength of the light the two beams will cancel and then the signal will drop to zero so this is the simple uh, uh, concept of uh, constructive and destructive interference that uh, uh, we are used to so as the phase difference of the two light beams depends on the difference of their uh, uh, optical path and if it changes slightly the what what i did see here in the photo detector uh, would change uh this, so 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 that's the basic idea that we are trying to uh, uh see what the response would be uh, as a consequence of the interference of these uh, two beams now consider that i have set up another star here instead of just one source here we now have one more object we, we put it here then what would happen what would happen to the fringe in that case uh so what happens that uh uh the the signal in this case would be given uh, we, we are anyway taking time average of the signal and the phase difference for the two independent sources uh, that we have here will actually be essentially random so the interfering terms would average out and since and this would happen because these two sources are independent right they are incoherent uh, i mean they are in radiating independently so as a result of uh, that uh, the fringes will be washed out but what happens if these two sources are actually uh, coherent right so in case of these in two incoherent sources you can see that this is what is uh, going to take place right e1 and e2 are the fields due to this and then if we are looking for the intensity then we have this uh, second step and then this is my uh, uh, correlation term and that would uh, average out to zero right so no fringe pattern but now consider a scenario which also uh, we are very much uh, used to that if we have uh, two sources uh, uh, instead of in, uh, two incoherent sources we have uh, now uh, uh, a, a single source but we consider that uh, light from this is traveling along two different paths right so then what would happen that these two will actually have some uh, correlation between them and in that case we will see fringe pattern as a result of it right so in the output what we will get is the sum of the fringe patterns due to the two and the two fringe patterns can then wash out each other depending on how they are aligned how the optical path difference is so that's what will happen so uh, the lesson uh, for us to learn here is that uh, if you are looking at an extended source in the sky it can actually be then taken as an ensemble of independently emitting sources and they have nothing to do with each other fringes will wash out as the source extent is especially increased but as a result what happens that the amplitude of the fringe decreases and completely disappear for extended source so what michelson did was to actually measure that how this uh, uh, amplitude is decreasing he introduced a term called visibility right which is uh, defined as like i max my i min and i max plus i min so when the source is resolved uh, fringe visibility is unresolved it's equal to 1 and then there will be reduction in the visibility as the source extent is increased right because maximum of the two fringe patterns will not uh, coincide with each other so this is very much the principle of michelson interferometer and it very analogously it is used in uh, also radio interferometry but, but before going to radio interferometry i will nudge you in the direction of uh, to read about uh, c cliff radio interferometer i'm not going to talk about anything about this but this is something you can google and read about it uh, in your own time and you see like how uh, the first attempt at radio interferometry was made right so this is this is very interesting and lot of uh, history involved uh, there so now going back to the principle of uh, michelson interferometer and how it is actually uh, used in uh, radio interferometry so let's consider this uh, uh, following uh, scenario so what is the difference uh, so we, when we are considering michelson interferometer we were looking at this addition interferometer in that case right at e1 plus right that was the time but in case of uh, when we are 
but but we know that all the interesting information that we are interested here is actually in this uh, cross that is the interferometric terms but in case of radial telescopes what happens that we can directly sample uh, the electric field unlike when we were doing in at optical wavelength we were actually dealing with uh, brightness here we can actually directly sample the electric field so it is actually possible to directly measure the coherency right, which is e1 and e2 star e1 and e2 being the field being sampled by these two dishes uh, one and two here in that case right so think of a scenario that i have these two dishes pointed to a certain direction in the sky radiation is falling on them and then these two uh, will sample what is the electric field uh, corresponding to that incident incident wavefront at the location and we call that as e1 and e2 Right. Specifically speaking, that will be like what we are measuring here is actually the voltages uh, V1 and V2. So I can write V1 as uh, like this: A1 cos 2 pi nu t nu nu here being the frequency and A being the amplitude. So this 2 pi nu t is actually the phase term. And you can see that the radiation at one of the dishes here will actually arrive a little later. So what this means is that there will be a geometric time delay. I'm calling it geometric time delay because this is just uh, happening because of the uh, The, the geometric aspect, the geometric separation between the two dishes, and and what happens that if the separation between two dish is is, is certain, uh, uh, like for example uh, B, then what would happen that uh, starting from uh, from that direct particular to that direction, this what one is seeing actually there is the projected separation or the projected baseline, which is uh, you can see like is B sine theta by C, right? So that's how this geometric delay is uh, understood. So when I put these two and you use the simple uh, trigonometric identity, you you will find that this cross term that I'm measuring is actually directly proportional to cos two pi nu uh, tau t, right? So multiplication interferometer is what uh, we are doing here, and in this case, what happens that only signal uncommon to the antennas, right, is measured. Anything which is correlated is actually the way. So there is no noise bias in this case. That's one advantage that we get. Uh, Of doing an experiment in this uh, manner, so let's now build this idea uh, a little more, uh, delve a little bit deeper into it. So we know that the, this phase uh, term that is coming is sensitive to the position that I am looking in the sky, d theta by d phi. Theta is this angle with respect to the zenith, right? So the phase phi that I am measuring is changing uh, with respect to that. So now, if you recall that when we were using single aperture, right? A single dish, then the resolution that I was getting, uh, if you recall the Bessel's function, it was corresponding to the the width 1.22 lambda by t. The d was actually the size of the aperture there. But now the fact that I am doing uh, this using these two uh, interferometers, uh, two dishes here, and come taking uh, a cross product of them and measuring the signal, then in this case actually the resolution is actually not this d capital D, which was the size of the aperture. But it is actually corresponding to B, which is actually the separation, the projected separation or the projected baseline that is being made by these two dishes. Right. So this is the very first uh, uh, point to uh, note that the resolution that I can get from this configuration is actually the separation between the two dishes. So this now goes back to the statement that I was making uh, yesterday. That when I have these two, uh, that when we have these uh, 30 dishes spread over 25 kilometer, the resolution is actually corresponding to an aperture which is of this much size, right? 25 kilometer and not the 45 meter diameter. So this is the first very major achievement uh, of this uh, idea. And then, of course, the visibility that we are measuring it contains information about the source position as well as the So size, right? That also we can appreciate because it would change if I'm pointing to different directions in the sky, right? So how do we uh, understand a little bit more formally? Uh, that for that, uh, uh, I, we we can uh, work out what is called the Fenster Zernike theorem, and there's something you can look at it in this radio astronomy book, um, uh, Thomson Moran and Swenson. But you can also go to any of the optics books, for example, like you can go to a book uh, by uh, Bond and Wolf. And uh, what I'm going to do here uh, in next few minutes is to give you the basic <coughs> idea, which uh, we have already discussed. But what we are doing here is that consider this extended uh, 
incoherent source in the sky so it's extended incoherent means that different points in the source are actually uh, radiating independently of each other so we can consider this as an ensemble of uh, incoherent sources and what we are trying to measure at these points p1 and p2 you can consider these as positions of uh, the two dishes here like this right and and what we are trying to do at these points is to actually measure what is the electric field uh, uh, corresponding to the incident radiation field right and that is something that can be written like this and if i uh, what i had done here uh, uh, through this multiplication i am doing this uh, the same thing here and i take the time average which is represented by these uh, brackets and if i work out what comes out of this then in under certain approximation you can see that this actually is uh, reduced to a simple two dimensional uh, fourier transform right so what this means is that if i can sample or measure uh, visibilities now you know the origin of term visibility also if i can measure these visibilities using a pair of antennas on the ground and i take a fourier transform of this that would just be the image of what i am looking at in the sky right formally speaking this is corresponding to the intensity distribution in the sky okay and with this i have a resolution of uh, lambda by d so now the next question that we want to understand uh, actually there are two very important uh, points to understand here first is to understand that why is it that i need uh, many dishes now at the same time right what, uh, what is the requirement of that so what is it that uh, if i take uh, two dishes at a time what is it that uh, they are measuring so they are actually uh, measuring uh, visibility corresponding to the separation between these two uh, dishes right so they are only sensitive to structures with the angular extent of the order of lambda by p that are uh, picked up by this in interferometer and if you are looking at a certain uh, intensity distribution in will in the sky it will have a lot of structure right and so so to uh, collect all the fourier comp different fourier components corresponding to those different uh, uh, structures in the sky i need dishes with different separation right because uh, this uh, if i take the if you recall the similarity theorem of uh, the, uh, Fourier transform. If I have like these two antennas which are close by, they are measuring Fourier component corresponding to a very extended distribution in the sky. But when I may move these two dishes further away, then they are actually measuring Fourier component corresponding to the fine scale structure in the sky, right? And then to make an image which will have information about all these different structures, I need to put together all these Fourier components, right? Which is what this integral represents actually, right? Mathematically, if you pay attention to this. so this integration is uh, representing that actually that we are collecting all these different fourier components and we are going to actually integrate over all of sum over all of them and that's what my good image will be if i don't do that my image would have very limited information so that's one thing and second thing is that i i, I told you that it, when we are doing this multiplication interferometer we are sampling the field directly right so what we are measuring here is not uh, actually just a single quantity we are measuring here uh, two quantities right and what are those two quantities one is the amplitude and one is the phase so visibility that i am representing here is not only uh, it's not just a real number it's a complex number yeah. okay because i am measuring both amplitude and phase so how do we so if you want two quantities this means that you have to make two measurements so what the way it is done is that if we have this v1 and v2 coming in and i take uh, this uh, multiplication then i get cos 2 pi nu tau g and in a, in a second instance what i can do is that i can introduce a phase delay of uh, pi by 2 here and then what i will get is the sin 2 pi nu tau g right that's the simple thing so if i take these two measurements which can are made simultaneously then i what i get is complex visibility you know that we can represent it like this using a, a, an exponential or i can actually also uh, tell you that amplitude is simply plus uh, the uh, square sum of this and take the square root and phase term is this right so this is how, what we do so we are measuring both amplitude and phase this is extremely important to remember now uh, 
I, I, what we are going to do is that we are now going to so so as an idea, it is it is now beginning to I hope make make sense that uh, uh, and and you will be uh, uh, very much convinced uh, if you actually uh, do a formal derivation of Pantzer's Zernike theorem by going through one of the references that uh, I have. Uh, provided you and so the basic idea that is that if we can measure this uh, visibility on ground uh, VUV then I can uh, take the Fourier transform of this and that would give me the image right that's that's all uh, we have to do right and and now we also understand that to sample this uh, visibility on ground instead of taking two antennas it is best to take a large number of antennas because then it can be done much more efficiently because if we spread them over a distance instead of moving these uh, dishes, same set of dishes, that can also be done. And I'll show you some example where the telescopes are actually put on rail tracks and they can be moved and uh, you move them and then you measure a different Fourier component and then you move them again and move another set of Fourier components. And like that, you can do and combine all that data together. But it is much more economically done if you can have actually uh, a large number of antennas spread over a certain uh, distance and at a given point of time itself, if all these dishes are pointing at that particular location in the sky, then you state of it collect several Fourier components, right? And another thing that happens that now as this source will be moving in the sky, right? This is now moving. So now the same set of antennas actually will act, uh, will be uh, creating a different projected baseline, right? You remember that B sine theta term? So that theta is changing, right? So if uh, at, at when I was looking at it, these two antennas were looking at a source at the zenith, then the, there is certain baseline separation. But as it is now moving, then this projected baseline is changing, right? So what this means is just because of the fact that Earth is rotating and I continue to track the same position or same sources in the sky, I am actually measuring different Fourier components corresponding to this, right? So this is, I am taking advantage of two things by distributing a lot of antennas and then tracking the same source and taking advantage of the, the rotation of Earth actually I am able to, using the same set of antennas, I am able to measure a variety of Fourier components, right? So, so just through a combination of these two things, I, we can um, build an interferometer inter which is much more economical, right? Taking advantage of our rotation and uh, judiciously distributing this uh, antennas over a certain uh, region. So what is the next? So next, what we want to do is to uh, understand a little bit more that how it is actually really done. So there's one more conceptual uh, thing to understand here. One is that this integral, if you look, if, if you recall that simple Fourier transform uh, expression, if I go back to it, right? Let's say, for example, here, it goes from minus infinity to infinity, right? Uh, here, like it goes from minus infinity to infinity. So then, uh, you can ask uh, this question that this u v u and v are the separation between uh, uh, and antenna right, side in a certain uh, coordinate frame. So now, uh, how can I measure like uh, this visibility corresponding to negative separations minus u and minus v? Right? How can you measure at negative uh, frequencies? That does not exist here. In, how can I make that measurement? So for that. Uh, we need to just understand uh, the following that uh, intensity distribution in the sky is real, right? Because that's the real intensity distribution we are talking about, we are talking about real sources, right? So this is absolutely real. So what happens as a result of complex algebra that it tells you that, that if uh, uh, ILM is real, right? And ILM and UV are related by Fourier transform. So if ILM is real and VUV is going to be Hermitian, that's what it means. What is the meaning of uh, Hermitian? It means that the real part is even and imaginary part is odd. So which, which is this like fx f star minus x. And if fx is my function e x plus over x, then if I know exactly, uh, if, if I know the fact that it is Hermitian, then I can uh, just by knowing uh, what is this, I can actually generate the f of minus x, right? So since mu v is Hermitian, we can measure only half of uh, the UV plane, which is just the positive frequency, and fill the other half with complex conjugates. Because this being Hermitian means that V U V is equals to V of minus U V, but uh, the complex conjugate of this, right? 
So, so just by making this measurement and doing this, I, I have actually information about the complete uh, UV plane. So before now uh, seeing how we actually do the Fourier inversion, let's look at uh, some of the real interferometers. So here, uh, I think uh, we now understand that for either dishes are distributed over such a region, 25 kilometer. And now as a result of this, the resolution from 0.3 degree has come down to three half seconds. Right, so that's what we have achieved. Now you can see if you are looking at that Orion Nebula now, then we will have an image which will be able to capture all the details which were there in the other HST image that we were uh, looking at. Okay, so here is an example of very large array which is situated in USA. It has 27 dishes and it of 25 meter diameter. Right, so this will be having a larger <coughs> field of view. But another speciality of this uh, telescope is. Uh, uh, that it is actually uh, the dishes are uh, located on rail tracks, which means that depending on the kind of uh, uh, source that we want to uh, image, we can actually uh, move these antennas. Right? If you if you are looking at a galaxy which has a lot of extended emission, then you can bring all these uh, dishes together so that you have more and more Fourier components corresponding to the extended uh, structure in the sky. Whereas, like if you want to uh, look at a source which has a lot of structure and you want to resolve it, then you can move these antennas far apart, then you will have a, uh, will have more Fourier components corresponding to the fine scale structure, right? So likewise, you can do that. And, and this is, so what we are seeing in this figure here is the, uh, what is called the, the, so these black dots here represent uh, the locations at which I have measured uh, uh, visibilities, right? So depending on which, at what location, how my antennas are distributed and how actually, and which location of uh, I'm looking at in the sky, the projected baselines will actually uh, follow a different uh, trajectory, right? You can see that like, if I'm looking at the source at 64, it is more circular and these trajectories become more like ellipses. If I go a little south, south and then they become even much more uh, shorter and elliptical if I'm going to sources which are even further uh, lower declination, right? So this is what uh, is the, uh, how uh, depending on the different sources or different locations in the sky, my sampling of uh, UV plane, uh, the visibilities uh, at which points they are sampled becomes different. So I have already started using some uh, realistic terms here like sampling, which means that when we when we started with benzeter zernike theorem, we were talking about a function which was like continuous, right? But uh, in reality, we don't, uh, Sam, uh, have a continuous function, we actually sample it at uh, particular points and these are those points here at which the measurements are being made, right? So what is the result of uh, doing this? If So if you look at this, so these are all the locations where I have sampled these visibilities. So what this means is that in this figure, if you look at where my cursor is, uh, I have actually equivalently synthesized an aperture which is of this size, right? And, and you can also see that it is very well sampled uh, in the central region, but as I go away, it is actually has got big holes. So that is what the kind of aperture that I have synthesized. And this aperture shape is, uh, and sampling is different depending on uh, where the source I'm looking at it. But uh, broadly speaking, the act of radio interferometry, what I'm doing is actually aperture synthesis. This is why it's called aperture synthesis, because by using this ensemble of antennas and tracking a source in the sky, uh, I have actually, and by adding signals in pair, right, multiplying them in pair electronically, I have uh, actually synthesized this aperture, which is of much larger uh, in size and gives you much larger resolution than as a result of it. So this is called aperture synthesis. And for this, uh, Martin Ryle in 1974, he was awarded a Nobel Prize for this uh, novel, uh, demonstrating this novel concept, right? So this is, uh, I think that uh, I would say this is a summary slide of whatever we have talked about now. So if I have a pair of antennas uh, and if I continue to track a, sky, track a particular source in the sky, then this is what the trajectory of the baseline will be in the UV plane. And by using a large number of such antennas, let's say if they're located along this Y shape, then I can have a uh, UV plane much more economically. Yes. Okay, much more economically. And then uh, by taking a Fourier transform of this, I can make complex uh, 
images like this right so what you are seeing in this image for example is a, a optical galaxy you can see at the center and there are many more other sources also but in red what you see is the diffuse radio lobes of plasma that are actually uh, uh, coming out of uh, this galaxy and this is something you can see that this is a unique uh, feature there which would be seen only at the radio wavelengths and you can see the level of complexity which is there uh, captured in this case so these are the kinds of uh, unique and complex images that can be made uh, using uh, radio interferometry right that's uh, something which we can now be convinced so now let's uh, take a couple of more steps and we try to now understand that how exactly we are going to make the image right so when you do the van sitter zernike theorem uh, going back to that we can we, we, we can write this uh, van sitter zernike theorem like this right this is intensity pattern in the sky and this is the visibility in the sky and we know that uh, ilm is real so vuv is a uh, hermitian and you can also see uh, here that the limits uh, here are going from a minus infinity to infinity which would to start with suggests that i am actually receiving signal from everywhere in the sky just a moment i somebody has sent me chat message here let me see if it is related to okay so these are just questions so i am i will not uh, i will take them uh, at the end that is best let me go back to uh, sharing my screen right so so this is uh, so where were we so yeah we were talking about the limits of integration here and we were uh, talking about the fact that uh, the fact that this going from minus infinity to infinity gives the impression that i am receiving signal from everywhere in the sky but that is of course not true because if you recall uh, what we were discussing in the first lecture that uh, uh, we, we since we are using let's say a single dish uh, as an individual element in this case then we also need to incorporate here the antenna power pattern right or the coherence function the interferometer samples will be modified by this so what we do here is that we also introduce a term alm corresponding to so this is the antenna power pattern uh, so antenna would receive signal only in this right so this is uh, uh what it is uh, measured right and this is uh, all this complexity that you are seeing here it gets reduced under certain approximation it gets uh, reduced to a simple two dimensional uh, fourier transform okay what are those simple assumptions one one assumption is that if the interferometer is coplanar it means that this particular term w is uh, becomes zero right that all the tracks that i have are in uv plane there, there is no w component that's what it means or another approximation is that i have this uh, my aperture can see this large field of view but i am imaging only a very small portion of the telescope right so then this term actually becomes uh, negligible in this case again also this last term will drop out and then you will get a simple 2d fourier transform so in such cases you can see that it, this is a simple 2d fourier transform and i can take an inversion of it and i will get an image but of course in practical practically we make images of entire field of view of the telescope and that is very much a routine work for <clears throat> astronomers uh, but i am not going in the details of it uh, because of the uh, limited time that we have but but that is something which is done so we are going to focus only on this special case here where uh, we can make this uh, approximate to a simple 2d uh, fourier transform then after that all i need to do is to, to do take an inverse fourier transform of this and i get this image right so i get an image which is actually modified by this alm right so that is something which you have to always keep in mind right so the aperture is representing the field of view that you are sensitive to so there are few more points uh, things to consider uh, the practical aspects so, and that is uh, uh, so keep this in your mind this is what it is uh, we are still putting integrals here thinking of them as continuous function but in reality what is happening that visibility is actually discretely sampled right 
So this is essentially what we were looking at here in the UV coverage, here, right? So these are the points at which the visibility is sampled, right? So what I need to introduce or uh, consider here is this sampling function. This is a set of delta functions where it, this value of this function is one where there is a measurement and it is zero where there is no measurement, right? So if visibility was this continuous function here, you can see then uh, my actual measurement is this Vs, right? Basically, I have sampled it, it like this. In a short form, I can write it like this, that V of S is, is equal to S uh, multiplied by V, right? So now recall your uh, convolution theorem, right? So what does uh, convolution theorem was uh, telling us? Uh, and, and if you take that, uh, the Fourier transform of uh, this and Fourier, this is what it will be like, f of s and f of v. So in image domain, what I will get is the convolution of the Fourier transform of s and Fourier transform of v. What does this mean? So my sampling function is uh, has is something like this, right? Let us, let, let us think of it like that. My sampling function is like this. So it will have a certain Fourier transform of it. What is that Fourier transform? That Fourier transform is nothing but the uh, image uh, in property of my device. You can it is exactly uh, the point spread function that we talk about in when we are uh, making an image with a telescope, right? So this is the Fourier transform. This is the point spread function here. You, if you, are, if you want to visualize it for a circular aperture, you can think of it like it is some kind of a, an Aries disk that we are talking about here. So what would happen that any every source that we have in the image plane will is actually convolved with this. So this is how my image will uh, look like. So let's say if my my sky is like this, you can see in your screen these points source, discrete point sources in the sky. These could be some galaxies or AGNs in the sky, right? And this is my point spread function, which I was talking about, right? This is the Fourier transform of my sampling function here, right? So this and this is now convolved, which means that I shift and multiply. This means that wherever there is signal in my image, it will get multiplied by this point spread function. So you can see that each point source, which was like a nice kind of uh, delta function you can think of is actually, or, or a Gaussian, simple Gaussian, is now actually looking like this, uh, right? So this is what uh, we in radio astronomy call as uh, a dirty image. So this is what uh, we refer to as a dirty image. And, uh, and uh, what we can do is, since we know my sampling function precisely, right? Because I have made the measurement with the telescope, so I know this. I can make uh, the Fourier transform of this precisely. So I know what exactly this function looks like. So I can iteratively remove the effect of this and with some approximation, go back to getting an image which is pretty close to like this, right? So that's what uh, happens uh, in this case. So what uh, this process is called, is called deconvolution and uh, it involves we determine the point spread function and iteratively we remove the effect of this, okay? and there are, and this is like a pretty a very much an area of active research even now because uh, this is a very uh, although uh, it it sounds that and it is factually correct that it is something which can be done very uh, accurately because we know everything about it but to be able to do it correctly it is very computationally intensive right so it is uh, so always like a lot of research going on in uh, in, in radio astronomy to uh, work out algorithms and methods through which this can be done uh, very precisely, but also very uh, efficiently. So, so that's uh, always the minister the challenge. Okay. So, here I, I, I want, to, want to make a couple of quick remarks. One is that since I'm, uh, although I'm doing a purchase synthesis and I'm getting this uh, nice resolution, which is corresponding to a longer space line, but the fact that I'm missing certain Fourier components is what it means is that it's going to affect the quality of the point spread function I have actually, right? So this point spread function will, will have, will become, will have higher and higher side lobes, uh, more poorer my UV coverages, right? So the, it's always uh, our goal to make uh, this as uh, good as possible, right? I'm going to skip this part and I'm going to actually talk so about something which will be slightly more interesting in the current context, which is that, uh, which is uh, that any experiment involves uh, what is called uh, calibration, right? And, and uh, it's true here also, because of the visibilities that we are observing uh, on ground, they are not true visibilities. What I mean, uh, they are not true visibilities is that 
because the radiation when it is uh, traveling through the space and ionosphere and all the electronics that uh, consist uh, that my telescope consists of it is getting modified right so what we need to do as a first step is actually to uh, correctly uh, make corrections for that uh, uh, modification that has taken place to recover the two visibilities so what is uh, the act of recovering two visibilities here it means that i should actually recover what the original amplitude and what the original phase term is corresponding to uh, this particular uh, baseline right how do i do that so the interesting thing to consider here is that uh, i am measuring both amplitude and phase so i need to do this uh, correction for both uh, amplitude and phase here so let us try to see how uh, does it uh, Uh, work out here right so uh, let us say uh, uh, on left you see an image uh, here a photograph it's, it's just a photograph of a industrial area here and if i take a fourier transform of this it will look something like this okay and now consider another example so if i had taken this fourier transform so what i do is that i take only the top 12% of the components and i take a fourier transform back and and i get this image so you can see that this image and this image look pretty fine actually right so it's, it's so it's not that so you must be thinking here when i was showing this that you oh got we have so many holes and things like that i'm missing so many fourier components especially like in this case and this case what is it that how do i believe that what i'm seeing actually right so you don't always need many many fourier components to reconstruct that's one thing and if you take even 5% you still have a lot uh, resemblance right so now let's look at what happens between phase and amplitude right so this is now an image of a clock here yeah? and uh, what we do here is that we take amplitude and phase both of this okay and in the top case what i have done is that i randomize amplitude but keep the phase term same okay and in the second case what i will do is that i will keep the amplitude terms as it was coming but i will actually uh, randomize the phase term so what the result i get is that in the case where i had actually uh, randomized amplitude but kept the phase same then i do get actually this uh, still what i get is i can make out that this is a clock but in the second one it's like just completely washed out i have no issue right so, so even from young sample set experiment you would uh, can appreciate and here is a more explicit example that phase is certainly a very important thing if you want to do the imaging and here is another example of it these are on top there are two images what uh, we have done uh, in this case here that uh, we take the amplitude of one and uh, swap it with the phase of the other and then the image then comes out corresponds to pretty much the phase of uh, or the or uh, the, the image from which we had drawn the phase term right so what this uh, tells us that amplitude uh, what is amplitude is actually it's the magnitude of the spatial frequency the frequency for the component that i'm talking about and phase is its location right and image is what image is nothing but how the intensity is distributed in the image plane okay so if i lose my phase term i lose that information that how the intensity is distributed in the image plane and then i cannot really make an image out of it uh, anymore so then uh, so so we have to pass visibility through a set of uh, uh, complex uh, uh, calibration steps so we need to correct for uh, things like uh, propagation to ionosphere propagation to all the electronics so, but all this thing is like well formulated and can be done computationally and at the end of it what we get is actually the two visibilities and once we get these two visibilities then we can again uh, get, get the fourier transform so i'm not going into the detail of the actual calibration itself but uh, because i am only highlighting at this point to you the uh, main uh, aspects of uh, radio interferometry and uh, of course uh, we have been talking uh, up, up to this point about resolution uh, there is one more thing to consider here is the sensitivity right so sensitivity may what happen that since i am looking have now at each instance i am uh, uh, so i have let's say n antennas so at each instance i am measuring n n minus 1 by 2 correlations or visibilities right 
and if i'm looking at the same part of the sky and tracking right and this is my bandwidth delta nu and and each integ times integration i am measuring a sample right total like let's say i am integrating it for let's say one hour then all these things will act samples will contribute to the sensitivity of my image right so that's uh, where the sensitivity comes from that's where the number of antennas would uh, uh, correspond to uh, how sensitive uh, my interferometer is my images and then of course the gain of individual antennas that we were talking about in the context of single dish would also come into play then so uh, one of the major challenges that we face in radio interferometry is that the large volumes of data that we get so if you take one of the most sensitive or the most uh, modern telescope mirka telescope in south africa it's a precursor of square kilometer array by precursor it means that uh, it now has three four antennas but in future in next coming to coming years it will actually be expanded to become the uh, part of sk phase 1 right and it uh, has a very wide bandwidth 856 megahertz and it has 32000 channels so this is like a very powerful telescope collecting a lot of information instantaneously and then it would actually in 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 an hour actually produces a terabyte of data that's that, that's huge if you compare it with the amount of data for example is generated by gmrt right and so so to process this and uh, uh uh do fourier transformation and everything that we were talking about uh, is, is is a huge task actually and uh, so uh before concluding uh, I, there are some uh, uh corrections or misconceptions that may have come in uh, that i should uh, try to remove one is that uh, we talked about uh, dipoles and we said that like okay dipoles are not particularly that exciting it's better to use them in combination with a parabolic reflector but it's not so useless effect especially if you are observing at very low frequencies uh, and in fact arrays of dipoles then can be used to form multiple beams it's called the concept of beam forming and electronically then one can steer it to the different locations in the sky and in fact at low frequencies if you look at telescopes like lofar in netherlands and mw in australia they use uh, arrays of large number of dipoles which are just placed on the ground and then they are used to actually uh, uh, do interferometry and uh, and it's, it's a very efficient uh, process at that uh, frequency and second thing where we were talking about in the context of single dish is that we actually use uh, instead of just putting a dipole at the focus we can have an array of dipoles so that, uh, we can have focal plane array uh, and the same thing can be actually extended to interferometry we can have what is called phase array feed so if you want to know more about that you can look at australian square kilometer array pathfinder ascap which is uh, from the name as it is obvious that it is situated in australia so these are some of the very modern telescopes like ascap mircat right or jansky vla if you talk about and gmrt uh, it's close to pune has also been upgraded to have very wide bandwidth it's, it's, it's not instead of this name or its new gmrt which is upgraded gmrt Uh, and what uh, uh, the entire radio astronomy community is currently working towards is what is called the SKA or the square kilometer array it will consist of two components uh, like the row frequency component which i was talking about which will consist of mainly dipole will be situated in australia and that's called SKA low and then uh, uh, the uh, component which will be operating at uh, mid frequency range which will be situated in south africa and these locations are chosen uh, for the main reason one of the main reason being that they are uh, it has been possible to identify sites uh, in australia and south africa which are actually away from uh, any city and so these places are like have very little radio frequency uh, interference which is locally generated right so that's that's one of the main reasons so this slide here is showing you a comparison between the telescopes which have been uh operating at different times and now and then you can see how uh, sk is going to change it so i am now going to show you a bit of uh, animation here so this is how sk made when it is operational it will look like so you can see that it's situated in a desert it is a huge number of dishes you can see that the feed is actually not situated at the center it's not located at the center because it's actually off axis right that's also done because it will improve the imaging property of the telescope so it reduces the feed uh, aperture blockage 
and this is uh, the visualization of how when uh, how the sk is low component in australia will look like again you can see that it's like completely empty right So the construction of SK starts this year. So it's, it's, it's really a very exciting time in uh, radio astronomy. So this is where uh, one is uh, comparing the resolution and the able to do surveys and the sensitivity between uh, uh, different uh, telescopes here, right? And what SK will do is that SK will actually uh, revol revolutionize our understanding of the universe. There's the main key science drivers behind SK are like, galaxy evolution, cosmology, and dark energy. And it goes up to the cradle of life and exploring uh, the questions like uh, whether even life exists uh, elsewhere. So the precursor telescopes such as Mirkat in South Africa are, are being used to prepare us for SK. And in fact, Mirkat is actually a precursor. It will actually grow out into SK. So this is pretty much my last slide. And uh, I will uh, just uh, put up this last uh, uh, slide here, which is uh, corresponds to the Mirkat Absorption Line Survey, which some of us at IUCA are leading and are involved in. This is a large survey, so if uh, anyone wants to know more about Mirkat and uh, SK, you can actually look at the SK site, and, uh, SK website, and also look at uh, uh, about uh, the site at miles.iuka.in to know more about uh, miles and how you can get involved in these. Okay, so this is now the end of uh, what you wanted to cover, and it, it's uh, quite a lot actually that we have covered. It was to give you a flavor of all different aspects of uh, radio astronomy, starting with uh, a single dish telescope and a bit of Fourier optics, how we can understand uh, imaging using simple uh, Fourier transforms. And once we do that, then how actually we can do radio interferometry whose roots actually lie in max interferometry. So if you want to develop a deeper understanding of it, uh, you must go back to uh, your concepts of Fourier transform, Fourier optics, uh, try to understand more max interferometer, what's the difference between an addition interferometer and multiplication interferometer. And then when you have that understanding, then after that, with some uh, uh, exposure to uh, real algebra and computational skills, you are pretty much ready to uh, do uh, professional radio astronomy. That's, that's the way it works, right? So now let me go through some of the questions. Okay, somebody was saying my voice is breaking. I hope it was not throughout. Yeah, so this uh, somebody asking that how do we are measuring intensity, how do we want to know the number of photons? So, no, it's like uh, the wavelengths that we are uh, uh, operating, we are not uh, talking about number of photons, we are talking about uh, wave fronts uh, at this. And you saw that at radio interferometry, especially, we are actually sampling the electric field corresponding to that, right? And you can, if you, if you are sort of insistent on drawing an analogy between optical. Uh, uh, imaging then what you can think of is like uh, this whole act of sampling visibilities and then making the fluid transform this whole thing is actually is the act of synthesizing a lens right it's not uh, apart from that uh, they, are, they are very different so Babab is asking during sampling how do we choose which points to take and which ones to reject right so that's a very good question so the, so uh, since I, so I have, let's say my interferometer, which has dishes uh, fixed on ground. Uh, so, and I'm tracking a certain source in the sky. So, uh, gun rotation synthesis, uh, I will have certain the projected baselines. So at that point, I will take everything that I get, right? But after that, I can do two things. One is that it's possible that there were times when uh, my telescope was malfunctioning. There was some problem with uh, some particular dish or certain part of the correlator uh, in that those data points i can reject i have to reject right that's one thing that i do but after that uh, if i want to just take advantage of all the data that i have collected that if, if, if i want to make the most sensitive image out of it 
then I should actually just give uh, same weightage to all the data points, right? Uh, and then that's, that would be my most sensitive image out of it. But in radio interferometry, what we do is that we can actually assign different weightages to different Fourier components if we want to enhance or investigate a particular structure uh, that we are imaging in the sky. So what it means is that, let us say, I have Fourier components which are corresponding to large scale distribution as well as the fine scale uh, structure in the sky, but I am interested only in the high surface brightness sensitivity. That I want to really just see at how is my, uh, actually, uh, the diffuse emission is looking in the sky. Then what I would do is that I can give very low weight or even reject uh, the Fourier components which are corresponding to very long baselines and I can just make an image out of that, right? So this is the advantage. This is another aspect of radio interferometry which is different from, uh, you say, optical uh, imaging where you, once you make a telescope, your lens is fixed, right? Your optics is fixed. You cannot, you don't really change that. But since uh, uh, in case of radio interferometry, I can assign these different uh, weightages to my different vis uh, visibilities. I can actually change the property of my lens, right? That's... Uh, that's a very uh, cool thing that happens. But in construction, somebody asking that in construction, top 12%, 12 or 55% per components, you would have chosen those with highest magnitude. Yes, of course, that's the point. Uh, but the point I was trying to make is that most of the information is con contained in a small number of your components. That's the point I was trying to make, right? So is it the explanation when we really face Okay, this we proceed. Somebody asking uh, there's a hypothetical question. What if we have thousands of dipole arrays on individual houses? Will it have some useful data generated, right? Or it will all die out in other radio signals nearby. So uh, so if, if the nearby radio signal is happening at the same frequency, for example, right, then uh, of course it will be overwhelmingly strong and it can sort of wash out what you're trying to detect. But let us say, uh, but interferometers have this nice property that they can actually uh, uh, collect uh, what is correlated and everything that is uncorrelated uh, goes away. So take an example, like a, let's say a dipole is located in my house and another dipole is located uh, in your house, that is uh, Abhay's house. Uh, and then he produces some terrestrial interfer local localized interference, which my dipole cannot see. And when I do the cor correlation, then uh, that correlated signal will not have that, right? So that way, not everything will be washed out. So we can, uh, we have to really know what is it, but it is possible to get some useful data in principle. Yes, that is correct. But uh, the challenge would be to be able to combine uh, those uh, voltages that these individual dipoles are collecting electronically. So the expensive part would be to be able to uh, develop the electronics through which you can carry out that correlation. And then once you have collected those uh, correlation, that is visibilities and do a Fourier transform of it. So that will be the expensive part of it. Putting dipoles on each house is going to be very, very cheap. That is not going to be very expensive. But it's the back end that will cost you a lot. And when you find, when when you will estimate the cost and everything, you will find that maybe perhaps it is better to do it in a remote site somewhere where you have more control over everything, right? Do we take the effect due to space, dust, etc., and visibility? That's an interesting question, but uh, this is something which we understand now that since at, we are talking about radio wavelengths here, which are much longer, so they are not affected by dust in the interstellar medium, right? These wavelengths are much longer. They affect optical, ultraviolet, X-rays. Those are much shorter. Those are affected, not this. So somebody is asking that how uh, the SK telescopes are distributed in the plane is quite random. So the question is how their configuration related to the observed image and Fourier transformation. So, so the goal here is actually... Uh, so one thing that we have to decide uh, is uh, uh, that what is the kind of science we want to do. Like, for example, if my science requires me to map most of the times extended structure in the sky, then I will take most of my dishes and pack them close, right, towards the center of the array. 
and if that is uh, whereas if my uh, science requires that no i want to be looking at more final details then i will push them out right so depending on so if if, if i give you a telescope with 100 uh, dishes then you will do some calculations to estimate that okay i need the sensitivity of let's say 70 telescopes to detect the diffuse emission of my interest whereas like for uh, the uh, the extended structure i don't need that much right so then what you would do is that you will out of 100 to 70 you can pack them close but the rest of them you can spread out right so so that's the basic thing but after that then you would carry out uh, simulations and then you will from those simulations you will try to work out that what kind of arrangement of antennas would give me uh, a good imaging response what this means is that you don't want to just put them randomly anywhere you if 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 you want to uh, put a certain set of antennas uh, distribute them on ground you want to try your best that the visibility or the sampling function is fourier transform actually is as close to a gaussian as possible right because if that is the case then your side lobes will be very low this means that your dirty image that you made right with these point sources they should be fit to computationally is 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 very intensive actually it can take lot of lot of time some depending on the image can take many days many many days right the kind of corrections you want to apply to do that correction so but if if start with your point spread function is good then in that case you wouldn't have to uh, that process would become faster and simpler right so these are the considerations that you would make so so it it may look random to your eye but what has been done here is that some set of simulations has been done to identify a uh, first to de determine that okay for the different science cases uh, adequate sensitivity is there at different scales and after that then the antennas are distributed such that the point spread function will be will have as lower side lobes as possible Okay, some of the questions are uh, that I'm seeing now are related. Someone asked me, sir, can you use machine learning to plot and identify? Yes, yeah, of course. Like for source identification, not just uh, so, so so to detect them. uh and to actually uh characterize their properties machine learning is something which uh, people are using a lot because now with all these large surveys that are happening with this more very sensitive telescope people are detecting millions of sources right even uh, with our survey meter absorption line survey that i showed in the last slide we are detecting uh, numerous sources and numerous spectral features to characterize them machine learning is a, uh, is, is a tool that is uh, being widely explored and used and new techniques are being developed in this domain to do yes it is it is very much uh, uh, like a very hot topic currently so now let us so anushka i request you to unmute oh uh, yes hello sir i'm audible yes uh, so on the slide number 66 uh when we consider uh, it as uh, the hermitian uh for, for the uh, mathematical interpretations uh we can uh, we consider that uh, we are taking the real part as well as uh, we may take the real part of the uh, imaginary components by plotting uh, them so are we uh, looking at that data as the uh, as a hamiltonian uh, system or a non hamiltonian system no no don't go in that direction you are not look, looking at in hamiltonians and all we are not talking about that here what we are talking about here is something which is a lot uh, straight forward here uh, let me quickly again share my screen so this is what you are doing right if it is hermitian yes. it means that like real part is even an imaginary part is odd right so you have already measured vuv right and you mm -hmm. want to know what is the visibility at negative frequencies which is minus u and minus v right that's all you want to do so what you need to so this is nothing but just the complex conjugate of it that's uh, so you have to just do a complex conjugate of that and and you would get what what would be its value at negative frequencies so and like that you can do a fourier transform with that then right oh. 
Okay. This is very oh. simple real algebra you have to look at. Oh, okay, okay. And sir, so there is one more question. Uh, when uh, on slide number fifty nine, when we said that uh, we may uh introduce a phase difference between the two antennas that we were considering. Uh -huh. Uh, so uh, I mean, what is the uh physical interpretation of uh when we say that we we can introduce a phase difference? Like, right? for example, if we are looking at two different antennas, uh. Then can will we be able to say that they uh, they have a phase difference between them? I mean physically by looking at them or so is it? So you have to think it in terms of like uh, so this is a this is a signal which has got both amplitude and phase, right? So what you are doing here is that you are introducing a time delay, right? Because if you recall, two pi nu tau g is the phase term, right? So if I introduce a time delay, right? You can think of like you are hold, you hold that signal a little longer. See, this delay is introduced here. Uh, uh, let me again share my screen. So physically, uh, so see the delay is getting introduced here. If you see, is because of the the signal is arriving after a certain time here in this case, right? Mm. Isn't it? Yes. That's what. So the same thing. If you want to introduce a delay here, it is like you are talking about a time delay in this case. So you can think of like you hold the signal. Just introduce equivalent to introducing a phase term here. So. Okay. Okay. Fine. Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, so next is uh, Unix Sen Gupta. Uh, hello, sir. Am I hello. Yeah, yeah, clearly. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, for, sir, good morning. Uh, this was a really beautiful lecture. So, my question was the GMRT telescope, uh, as far as I read about it, it uses the Earth's rotation to complete its uh, circular structure. Like the three, those antennas, they are, they are just uh, forming three arms. And uh, they, does they use the Earth's rotation to complete the structure? I mean, my point Absolutely. was that. Uh, Yes. It is on the it is on the side. Uh, it's not on the polar point, polar axis. Uh, it's on the side uh, on the side portion of the globe. So how does it use all solution to complete the circular structure? So it is not always the. So again, I am going to uh, share my. One of the slides. Let's look at where it is. This one uh, gives a uh, right. So, if you look at uh, the slide which we have now, so this is also an example of uh, uh, this. This example corresponds to VLA. So, you can see that, like, the in case of VLA, the dishes are located along Y, right? But before I answer your question, I just want to also add one more thing that in case of GMRT. Actually, fourteen antennas are in in the central square where they are kind of randomly distributed, and remaining sixteen are along this Y shape. That's that's the uh, actu uh, di actual uh, distribution of antennas is. But let us talk about this Y. So, what happens that if uh, let's say certain source is looking at it uh, from a certain location in the sky, we are looking at it, right? My array. Think of it only two uh, dishes. Then what would happen that the Projected separation between the two antennas would change, right? As the source is uh, moving, right? And I'm pressing yes. it continuously. And that trajectory of that is actually like ellipsis, what you see here in general, right? You can work out that equation that will be like ellipsis. So now, in the cases when I am looking at uh, a certain source which is like uh, at a certain declination, then it may be more circular and then it can get actually. Uh, much more elliptical or, or become even very straight lines close to equator for a source close to declination zero, I meant to say, right? So these are the, so it can all become, a, uh, it will actually depend on how actually the uh, source looks like, uh, I mean, the, how I am tracking it. And if I just take a snapshot, right, which is this figure here, you can see that it's just discrete points and it, it is like, it looks like some kind of a star in this case. 
right? And this this snapshot for a source which is at zenith in for a Y shaped array. This is how it will look like in that case. And if I sort of continue to track, then it will sort of start getting filled, and then it can become uh, closer to something like this. Right? This is what this is how it will happen. So depending on where the telescope is located and where, which part of the sky we are looking at, uh, the coverage, uh, the UV coverage we call it, can have uh, like variety of shapes. Okay. okay, thank you. It's always like you will have many more points in the inner plane because you will have many more. And that's the geometry, right? You will have many more shorter baseline than compared to a longer baseline, which will be fewer in number. That's why as you go out, you see that the density of points goes out and outside you have like very big holes and it's very sparse. Okay, okay perfect. So there are no more questions here. Thanks, John. And thanks to all of you. It was really nice, nice, very nice questions at the end. And I'm sorry in case, uh, I hope the voice was not breaking too much today. And I hope next year we can have a face-to-face. -face. Thank you.